There are a lot of ancient tribes where they marked the line between childhood and adulthood by sending the person off into the wilds to be alone. They call it a vision quest. The person could be alone and find out what kind of vision came up from within the mind, from within the heart, independent of the training that the child had received. That was supposed to mark the person's adulthood, give a sense of what the adulthood would be all about. In a sense, that's what the line between childhood and adulthood is, is stepping back from the training we've received, stepping back from all the influences received as, as children, and finding a place within where we can decide what our own ideas are, what our own sense of our own direction in life is. And it's a shame that in modern culture we don't have that kind of time of quietude quietude, the ability to step back. But it's what we do when we meditate, is we're stepping back from all the influences inside our mind. Because you don't know where you got these influences from. There are lots of ideas sloshing around in your mind. Ideas that this is good, that's bad, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. And you have to stop and really take, take stock of these things. Find this place inside where you can be really, really quiet and really look at these voices for what they are. Instead of identifying with them, you watch them. You watch to see where they go, what they're coming from, where they're going. It's part of a, seeing them as part of a causal process. What kind of mind state do they have? What mind, kind of mind state do they come from? What kind of mind state do they encourage? Are those the kind of mind states you want to identify with? This is essentially what the Buddha's teaching on not-self is about, is seeing the things that have control over our lives, that have power over our minds. In the course of the meditation, stepping back a bit from them, gaining enough independence from them so we can simply look at them as events and see if we really want to follow along with them, if we really want to identify with them. As the Buddha pointed out in one of his discourses, you can't really look at these things as long as you're identifying with them. You've got to step back. And this applies not only to ideas in the mind, but also the body that we're sitting here, this form that we have. Feelings as they come and go, feelings of pleasure, feelings of pain, perceptions, thought constructs, even our consciousness of things. The meditation gives us a place where we can step back from these things and watch them, see the influence they have over the mind, and decide whether that's an influence you'd like them to continue having. So it's important as we practice to create this space where you can step back. The quietude is important. They talk about developing seclusion in the practice, and there are actually three kinds of seclusion. The first is simply physical seclusion, getting away from people. It's hard to get those voices out of the mind when people are constantly feeding them into your ears. And it's hard to focus on your own mind when you're running up against the contents of other people's minds all the time. You've got to get away. You've got to get out. Which is what you, we're doing as we come here, find a place of seclusion. We're not totally cut off from other people, but at least we're in a place where the, the values of the practice are honored, where the bottom line is not the profit margin. The bottom line is how you're training your mind, and a place where we try to give space to one another show respect for one another's need for quietude, need for concentration. But the problem is, as we come out to a place like this, that you don't leave your thoughts behind. Even though we may be here in the midst of physical seclusion, there's still a lot of 
companionship in our minds as we go and we sit under the trees. This thought comes along, that thought comes along. The Buddha talks about craving as being our constant companion. Not only the craving, but also thoughts of the past, thoughts of the future. As long as we're tied up in those, we're not really alone. So this is why we take the body in and of itself, sitting right here as our frame of reference. That's a way of developing seclusion, dropping unskillful mental states, dropping thoughts of the past and future, and just trying to be right here with the body in the present moment. Dropping thoughts of how much we'd like to see these things, or hear those things, or smell those things, or taste or touch. The things that we like, and being willing to let the mind just be here, secluded from all of that. Our culture is a very funny one. It tends to distrust people who are trying to get away from sensual attachments, partly because the economy would collapse. And also with our background of hearing about people who try to abandon sensual attachments tend to get kind of weird. But the truth of the matter is there's a part of the mind that flourishes when it is not burdened down with its sensual attachments. When it can let those go, when it really is secluded from that, it begins to blossom. And part of the practice is learning how to appreciate just that very still center of the mind, the sense of well-being that comes from dropping all those attachments. Even though we're not letting go of them for good, just drop them for the time being. Simply being with a sense of the breath coming in, going out in the present moment, allowing that to fill the body and allow it to find its own right rhythm. You nudge it a little bit here, nudge it a little bit there to make it feel good. And this makes it easier and easier to pull into the present moment and not get pulled away into the future and the past. So you get a greater and greater sense of seclusion, just being dropping, just dropping those distractions, dropping all those voices attitudes that pull you back or pull you forward, and allowing things just to be right here. Settle down with a sense of well-being, settle down with a sense of familiarity. It takes time, of course, to get familiar with the present moment, because for the most part we're just running through. It's like the little kid who runs home, grabs a sandwich, and then runs out again. That's, that's dinner. We have a little bit of sense of the present moment as we rush through from the past to the future, from the future to the past. Or when pain transfixes us in the present moment. Or doing the meditation is to get a sense of pleasure and well-being, allow that to transfix us in the present moment instead. This creates what's called mental seclusion. The past and the future drop away, and all you've got is the body sitting here breathing right here, right now. You've got the mindfulness keeping watch over what's reminding yourself to stay right here, and you've got alertness keeping watch over what's going on. And that's a much deeper and more satisfying sense of seclusion. It forms the basis for the third one, which is to be able to pull away from the things we've been identifying with. As in that discourse that we chanted just now, the discourse on the not-self characteristic. The Buddha was pointing out to the monks, if you let go of your attachment to form, feeling, perceptions, thought constructs, and consciousness, what happens? Well, in their case, they attained awakening. In other words, they became secluded even from their attachment to their sense of who they were in the present moment, because that's what our sense of who we are is made up out of. It's made up of those five kinds of things. Form, of course, the form of the body. Feelings you may identify with a pain, saying this is my pain, or you may identify with a feeling that feels more metaphysical, a larger sense of light or well-being, sense of bliss. Many times I think that that's who your true self is. Then there's the label that says, this is myself. Well, that's a perception, thought constructs. You identify with your thinking or the thinker. Or you identify with just basic consciousness. 
as long as you identify with these things, you're still not secluded from them. You still have companions. But when you create that still center inside and allow, allow yourself just simply watch these things as you step back and gain that sense of not identifying with these things. You don't have to identify. It's an act that we do. Our sense of who we are is something that we do, we create. And as you step back from these things and allow that activity of creating yourself over and over again to fall away, see what happens. The Buddha says an even greater sense of freedom comes. And when you have that greater sense of freedom, then instead of being slave to these things, you find that you can use them for good purposes. So this process of gaining seclusion is also a process not only of growing up, but is also gaining freedom. Looking at all the influences that are rushing around in our minds and getting a sense of getting a sense that we have the ability to choose which ideas are useful, which ones are not. which phenomena that we're aware of are useful, which ones are not. And not being driven around by them all the time. Most of us, life is a story, just that, being driven around. And it's a lot of conflict because there's so many different conflicting voices in our mind. This person gets under our skin, and all of a sudden we start identifying with that particular way of thinking. Another way of thinking gets under our skin. Well, that gets incorporated, too. You never really have a chance to sit back and see where, the, where things are harmonious and where they're not. A group of people called the Kalamas once asked the Buddha, how do we know these different teachings that come our way? This teacher comes and says, X is true. Another person comes and says, anyone who thinks X is true is crazy. Y is true instead. How do we know who's telling the truth and who's not? And the Buddha says, well, you can't go by outside teachers. That's the part of the teaching that everyone remembers. You can't go by old texts. You can't go by received wisdom. But at the same time, he also said, you can't go by your own sense of what you like and what you don't like, what fits in with your preconceived notions and what doesn't. That doesn't give you any proof of truth either. You have to look and see what, that when you do something, what are the results? If you act on particular mental qualities, which ones give happy results, uh, harmless results, and which ones give harm, harmful results? In other words, you have to look at cause and effect. So that applies not only to outside teachings, but also these voices we have in our minds, the things that we tend to identify with in ourselves. You have to step back and see what happens if you follow a particular way of perceiving things. Say, say you've got a particular kind of pain and you can perceive that pain in a certain way. You label it in a certain way. What happens? Is that a skillful way of labeling the pain? Could you label it some other way? Can you step back and get a sense of simply watching the pain and the perception as a series of events, part of a causal chain? What kind of sense of freedom? comes when you do that. So that teaching the Buddha gave to the Kalamas applies not only outside, but also inside. So what we do as we're meditating, even, even if we don't have vision quests anymore in our culture, we do have a sense, we do have a place when we meditate to have that same sense of seclusion, our ability to look and see what's in our minds, what you really want to identify with and what you don't. So it's through the meditation that we learn to grow up, that we learn to gain independence. We learn to stand on our own two feet. And John Lee once made the comment that people, even if they're 80 years old, if they're still a slave to their thoughts and their feelings and their body, then they're still children. Whereas the wise person who's able to no longer be a slave to these things. Maybe you're only seven years old, you're an adult. So think of the meditation as a process of giving yourself a chance to step back and 
make that line between childhood and adulthood. Draw the line and then step over into adulthood. By giving yourself that space, that sense of seclusion inside, where you have time to sit down and watch things for what they really are. gain the freedom that comes from that process. 